Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what we get to learn this morning and, and just to see your, your word go from Old Testament truths that so firmly connect to New Testament truths and how your whole word is combined together uh, to show one great testimony of your gospel and your work. And so we thank you, Lord, for, uh, for what we're about to look at here. And I, I pray that you would bless our time, help us to understand, help us to grow in it, help us to apply it to our circumstances in life. Holy Spirit, would you show us what we need to see here? And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, the Tower of Babel, that's our topic for today. It has, in fact, been the sermon topic I've been trying to preach for a few weeks now, um, but we're finally, it seems, going to do that. The Lord had other plans before, but we're going to look at that today, finally. Now, you might be asking, Pastor, did you forget that it was Palm Sunday? Why on earth would you be talking about the Tower of Babel when we ought to be hearing about palm branches and the coming of Christ and so on and so forth? Um, Well, surprisingly enough, I think what we'll find here is that the Tower of Babel has plenty to say to us, actually, about Palm Sunday in the end. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll see that by the end. In fact, it could be said that the Tower of Babel sets up a perfectly, uh, sets up perfectly in order for uh, us to appreciate Palm Sunday and what it's all about. Whereas the Tower of Babel is about the pride of human independence and self-sufficiency apart from God, Palm Sunday, and the cry, Hosanna, Far from saying, we don't need God is a cry that says, oh God, save us, we need you. And so you can think of the uh, Tower of Babel as almost the opposite picture of Palm Sunday. And I think we'll see that by the end. So let's start today. I want us to, uh, to start by looking at that. Whereas Babel is about rejecting the King of Heaven, Palm Sunday is about calling out for the King of Heaven to come and rescue sinners. So let's start by reading our passage and our account of the Tower of Babel by turning to Genesis 11, 1 to 9. I love this story. It's just small in Scripture. There's not a lot else said about it everywhere else in Scripture. I really love this passage. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. If you remember, this account of this tower follows after the incident of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah being found naked in his tent, right? And that whole, uh, that whole scenario. And then there's a bit of a genealogy. And then that comes. And then all of a sudden we have the tower story. And then that moves into more genealogies that leads to Abraham. And so it's really important to understand where it locks in to the story. So let's read Genesis 11, 1 to 9 together. Here it is, the account of the Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth." I'll let the Lord add a blessing to the reading of His Word. There's a very famous song out there. There's a very famous song by John Lennon called Imagine. Some celebrate it as a masterpiece of music and a song whose lyrics are a picture of perfect humanity, and it's celebrated. Maybe you uh, remember during this pandemic time, a bunch of celebrities got together and they thought they were going to be cute and they got together and they started Zoom calls and they all started singing Imagine by John Lennon over Zoom. 
And it was a way of trying to bring hope to humanity and to try to exalt the human spirit saying, don't worry, we're all in this together. And so the lyrics go like this. If you haven't heard it, I'm sure you have. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace, because that's what happens when you don't have religion in the world, apparently. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the whole world will be as one. I cannot think of a more disturbing, troubling song than that. Imagine no heaven, only sky above. In other words, no hope, no meaning, no goodness, no truth. No loving father who cares for us, no reason for us to be any more special than any other thing on this universe. No purpose, no inherent value. You and I are just stardust floating through the universe. Imagine no hell below us. You mean no justice, no wrongs punished. Evil gets away with it. And lastly, imagine there's no countries. That caught me because the Tower of Babel has a lot to say about that. The hope is that one day the world will live as one, he says. You know what's so striking about this song is just how much it reflects the Tower of Babel a desire for the human spirit to endeavor and to unite and to accomplish something great in the name of humanity and all independently of God, in rebellion to Him. We don't want Him anymore. We don't need Him anymore. What the song and the world discounts is this problem of sin and evil. You know, when they say, imagine if there was no religion in the world, we would just live as one. That's not what we saw in the last 20th century. In those countries where they threw God out the window, they killed each other by the tens of millions. That's not what it says. With the growth of human strength also comes with it the potential for its greatest evil because we're sinners. We like to think that we're just going to be peaceful and wonderful, but the problem is we're sinners and we have no antidote to it apart from God. And indeed, we see in our day such evil beings or such evil uh, being done in the name of a better tomorrow for humanity. In the name of unity, in the human spirit, religion and biblical truths are considered hindrances to humanity. How dare you say that men can only be men and women can only be women? You're in the way of progress. How dare you say that we need salvation from sin or we'll suffer hell's punishment? That's cruel. How dare we say that abortion is wrong? How dare we say that there is only one truth and it's God's? How dare we say that love rejoices in the truth? The love is nothing like how the world so often defines it. And how dare we say that there is a God who created us and that whom we are all accountable to under his authority. You see, these things get in the way of the human enterprise because the world wants to accomplish its agenda and throw away God's agenda. That is the Tower of Babel. That is what we see in humanity today. The tower is a form of self-worship. Verse 4 of Genesis 11, the people declare this. Let us build a city with a tower up to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. That's the great cry of the tower. That same sentiment, I think, carries on today. I don't think it's changed much. much. We still build towers today, right? In Dubai, we have the largest, one of the largest towers in the world Elon Musk just built the biggest factory in the world in Texas to build the future of humanity in the car industry. As the Tower of Babel, uh, sorry, at the Tower of Babel, when God confuses the languages, he frustrates that human pride and endeavor. And it really was a grace. It really was a grace. Instead of coming down and flooding the world again, which he said he wouldn't do, because the world was going once again in that direction of just throwing God aside. Instead of the flood, he confused the languages. He spreads them out on the earth. He tries to kind of disrupt where they're headed. And there's a purpose to that, because as he spreads it out, why, why is it important that the tower is right before Abraham? 
because Abraham is the father of many nations, and through Abraham is going to come the nation of Israel. Through the nation of Israel is going to come Jesus Christ, and it's going to go out to the whole world. The whole world will be blessed because of you, Abraham, it says. And so God spreads them out to stop their evil and to go after them, to go after them in Christ. And so he doesn't flood, he confuses the languages, spreads the people across the world in order to stunt the pride and the arrogance and the evil that would come from a united humanity that has thrown out God. God, who is the only bulwark against our own evil and sin. And so for, for us to understand, I think, the full extent of this, I want to unpack for you quickly what the city of Babel was all about. Okay, at one time, after the flood... We read here that there was only one language, okay? They leave the ark, they have the, the kids, and everybody goes out, and they start to have babies, and they start to grow again, and they go out from the ark, heading to the east, and, uh, and God had commanded Noah and his coming generations in Genesis 9-7, if you went back and saw that, he commands them that the people needed to be fruitful and multiply and disperse over the earth. That was the command of God. Be fruitful, multiply, disperse over the whole earth. That was the command. But what we see at Babel is a direct disobedience to that command. As the people grew, they came to this this plain of Shinar, it's called. And if you go into the, the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, it means the valley of the world. Isn't that interesting? And instead of dispersing around the world like God commanded, they decided to disobey God. And in their human spirit, they made bricks and stone and started to build a city. That city is Babel. Verse 4 says this about it. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the whole earth. That's not just a, a slap in the face of God. Lest we be dispersed over the whole earth. Let's just do this. It's rebellion against God right from the beginning, from Genesis 9 7. And as one person put it, the Babel enterprise is all about human independence and self-sufficiency apart from God. It's like a humanism situation. And the builders believe that they have no need for God. So right away, you see it. You see that they're being disobedient to God. They're not doing what God has said. So here's the start of this city, Babel. Now, if that's not enough to show the problem with Babel in God's eyes... Perhaps we can discover more by looking at the king of Babel. The king of Babel is not mentioned here in this passage, but it is mentioned earlier. Who, who was the ruler who founded it? Genesis 10, 8 to 11. It's a genealogy. It says this, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So Nimrod is the king of Babel. I'm sure you've heard that name before. We used to use it all the time as a way of calling someone an idiot. We would say that. We'd say, oh, you're being a Nimrod. Oh, you're Nimrod, we'd say. That's because only a fool would build a city and disobey God. Only a fool would pick a fight against the God of the universe. And indeed, he did pick a fight against God. If you go into ancient antiquity and and early Eastern writings and learn about Nimrod, we learn that Nimrod is the father of paganism. He was the founder of magical arts, astrology, and maybe even human sacrifice. That's according to Bill Cooper. He was maybe even worshipped as a god by early cultures. So even the Romans worshipped someone called Bacchus, was called a mighty hunter, just like the Bible says about him. And... uh, And the Roman name is from a Semitic name, meaning son of Cush, which Nimrod was, the son of Cush. Nimrod is the son of Cush and the descendant of Ham. In the writings of Josephus and the ancient Jewish historian, he's an ancient Jewish historian, in the book of Antiquities, book 1, chapter 4, he writes this traditional view about Nimrod. Nimrod said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. For he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach. And he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers with the flood. He persuaded his subjects not to find strength in God, but to believe in their own courage 
and to find peace and happiness. So that's what some of the ancient writings outside of the Bible speak of when it comes to Nimrod. I'm going to build a tower that even if the flood comes again, it won't reach us. And if God dares to flood the world again, I'm going to go after him. <laughs> this is the king of Nimrod, right? What a Nimrod. <laughs> this is the king of Babel. He is an antichrist type in the sense that like Cain before him, he hated God. He wanted to lead his people away from God in defiance of him. And it's suggested that Babel is the foundation of the coming city of Babylon, whose name means the gate of the gods and whose city was known for its ziggurats and its towers. What's really interesting, if you remember when Vance Nelson was here, he went through and talked about how it's interesting all over the world, we have ziggurats or towers that are made, and they all are very similar. They're all made in the same way and same design. How is it that the Eastern, uh, in Middle East, we have ziggurats uh, that match those that are in South America? And so the belief is that as the people rode out and left and dispersed across the earth, what went with them was the architecture of the ziggurat. And now across the world, you have evidence that they were all once together. They were all once together at one time. And so Babylon may have been started as well from this place of Babel. And uh, ba Babylon becomes an iconic city within Scripture that is opposed to God. So I could go all day about this stuff. I could, we could talk all day about this, but I think you're getting the point. Babel is not just some city that kind of thought, let's build a big tower, that would be fun, and they were just kind of ignorant. That's not the, the truth. I think there is more to it here. There was human pride at its worst, and a human pride that unified to make a name for themselves apart from God. And the, 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 the picture of Scripture has always been that we are to go out and live this life with God. He is to be our Lord. We are to live with Him in relationship. And here they're, they're pushing against that. And God identifies the danger of this. Verses 5 to 6, He says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So first of all, don't miss the irony of God having to come down to see this so-called tower, because they're like, we're going to build this tower right up to the heavens, and God's like, let me come down and see your tower. <laughs> that, that language is very uh, purposeful there. So God comes down to see their little tower, and uh, don't miss that point. There's a bit of mocking from God here. God is much higher than they are in their greatest ways. But God here sees the danger of a unified, self-confident humanity apart from a relationship with God. That kind of hits us in a weird way at first, doesn't it? This idea that it's a bad thing to have a unified, self-confident humanity apart from a relationship with God. Why is that such a danger? Why did God see that as a danger? Well, like in the garden, when God said that Adam and Eve cannot stay in the garden as sinners because what happens if they reach out and take of the tree of life and live forever? What happens when sinners never die or see their end? The potential for humanity's greatest evil exists because death is a grace on the world because even the worst of sinners and evil men will face an end. So there is a danger in a unified humanity where sin has not been dealt with. Who, so, who have turned from God. What evil will they eventually create and, be, and, and become? What evil will the human race create when they rely on humanism as their standard, when God and His standards and our relationship with Him is forsaken? What kind of things will we get into to do? Do we have to look very far? Do we have to look very far in our day? What, do we, what does every nation do when they want to go to war? They try to get everyone on the same page, the propaganda. Let's all just make sure we're all on the same page as we go to war and let's make sure we're unified together. This is right, this is good. We're seeing that. Do we need to look very far? I've said it before, the 20th century was the bloodiest century of all the centuries combined. That's hard to believe. Tens of millions dead. As God and his ways were tossed aside and human technology and accomplishment went forward, it ended in the slaughter of so many lives. We built nuclear bombs. The war machine was perfected. There's a danger in the human race that desires to make a future for ourselves, a name for ourselves, to make a future for humanity, but wants to do it apart from God. 
Progressivism is a term used for many atrocities and is an excuse to throw away truth. You're in the way of progress. And apparently, progress means to throw away the truths that we all have known. So what does God do? He breaks up the languages. He prevents men from going too far in their pride. God broke up their unity. The people are dispersed and began to create different nations. And so it's like, where do we get the different languages from? Where do we get the different nations from? This is where the Bible says it comes from. As one man puts it, it is the will of God, so long as sin is present, to employ nationalism in the reduction of sin. It's a very interesting thought, but that's the, ca the case. To employ nationalism in the reduction of sin, to keep us separated from oneness. And it's funny, because one day the Bible says there will be in a sense, a one world system. We're all going to be together, moving forward for the good of humanity, and it's not going to end well. The Bible talks about all the people that die then. So if you remember what Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before the fall. Well, it does because God causes the fall. God causes the fall. He brings it about. Babel was an example of pride, and in that pride, they fell. God comes along and he says, enough of this. I know where you're headed. I know where this is going. And he causes the fall. Because God is against those who are prideful. God's against that. God's against the prideful. And who do not humble themselves before the Lord? Who forget their place as creatures made to worship God and have a relationship with their creator. Humanity wants to build the future. We want to build back better. We've heard that. But if we do it apart from God, then we are simply another tower of Babel. God will disrupt and discipline us for our pride and our arrogance. God will not let our power mixed with sin get us to this uh, climax of humanity. God will disrupt it. If not simply by just giving us over to our sin and letting us sabotage our own enterprise. God will not permit proud rebellion to succeed we will eventually find our end. And we live in a world right now where that's trying to be had. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. That's James 4. There are a few things we can learn. There are a few things that we can learn from the Babel account personally, some applications that we can take away from this personally. Number one, God investigates the activities of arrogant morals. God investigates the activities of arrogant morals. We like to think that we can live as we wish and, do, and not face any response from God. We sometimes believe that God sits in the heavens and watches but never acts until He comes in the end and judges us. But Babel reminds us that this is not the case. God is active now in disrupting and disciplining His people. Do not think that you can live however you wish and sin in any way that you wish in private when no one's looking and think that God does not address you. That think that God is not with you. The reality of Scripture is that He disciplines those He loves. That's the reality. And so if you love, if He loves us, He's not going to just watch. He's going to come. He's going to work in our lives. If you're a father and you care about your kids, you're not just going to let them do whatever they want. You're going to check in on them. What are you doing? What are you doing down there? We're going to check in on them. This is something God does today and will do with us. Do not think that God's not aware of our lives. And so we need to live in that. We need to live in that reality that God is aware of our daily lives and actions and He cares. Consider Galatians 6 where we read, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whoever one, uh, whatever one sows, they will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So be careful what you sow in life, the decisions you make, the sins you tolerate. There's a great book, I think it's by Jerry Bridges, called The Sins We Tolerate. God will not be mocked. God investigates and responds. And so it just brings God real. Now, secondly, second point, God knows the danger of collective apostasy. Okay? God saw the danger of this unified people who had turned from God because here is the reality of their apostasy I think this gets to the heart of it. They had it in mind to nullify the purposes of God for their own purposes. They had it in mind to nullify the purposes of God for their own purposes. 
This is the great sin of the world. This is the great problem of the human heart and the great sin of the unbeliever. And we must not allow it to become our sin as Christians where we want to nullify the Lord's purposes in our lives for our own purposes, for what we want to do. We must not fear man more than we fear God. We must not compromise on truth nor sin freely. We must not give up the work of forgiveness and repentance in exchange for selfish ambition. We must not pursue that which is displeasing to the Lord. We must love what God loves, hate what God hates, and we must not nullify the purposes of God for our own purposes. So we need to get with it and know what God commands and obey it. We don't read our Bibles enough to even know what He says. Why? Why do we need to do that? Because not only is His way good, but He is good, and we need Him. We need Him. That's the difference of Babel. Babel says, we don't need you, God. We have to be in a place where we say, we need you, God. We desperately need Him in our lives. We need to take our Tower of Babel, which says, we don't need God, and exchange it for the palm leaves where we cry out, Hosanna, God save us. We need you. It's so interesting to see the difference between the Babel people and the Palm Sunday people. We need you, God. So don't miss, dismiss your king. He has come. We bow at his feet and we call him to lead and save us from our sins, to save you from yourself, to lead you in his good ways. That is what we need. We need to run from the city of Babel and run to the city of God, away from the world and towards his heavenly kingdom. But the wonderful thing that we find in Scripture is that He had to come for us. We couldn't get up to Him. That's the point of the tower. They tried. God said, I have to come down. We're in that place again as sinners. We can't get up to Him. He needs to come down to us, and that's exactly what He did. And that's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. And that brings us to this last application, which is don't get caught up in the world's rebellion. Nothing's changed. The world in its pride still wants to remove God and build a future devoid of Him. We need to be smart about that. We need to see it happening. We need to see it happening in our world. The world wants its way to come above God's ways. The world sees God as a hindrance to progress. The world wants to define for itself what is truth. And the world wants to behave and act however it wants without consequence from a creator God and divine judge. And so the world wants to build its tower and make a name for itself. Don't get caught up in the rebellion of the world. Friendship with the world makes you an an enemy of God, the Bible says. You're a child of the kingdom. God has spoken and has told us what his kingdom is about in his word. So we turn from the world, we turn from its rebellion, we joyfully serve King Jesus. So watch where you step. Be careful how you live because you can, have only, you can only have one master. You can't serve two. So let's serve Jesus. Don't get caught up in the rebellion of the world. So we know the nature of the world. We know the nature of the Tower of Babel. We don't want to get caught up in those things. But I want to talk here for a second real quickly about Palm Sunday as a comparison, as we've already done. Here's where this pivot happens. The Tower of Babel was a declaration, we don't need him. Palm Sunday was a declaration, Hosanna, God, we need you. Babel said, we are strong enough on our own. Let's make a name for ourselves. Palm Sunday says, have mercy on us, sinners, save us. We're morally bankrupt. We're spiritually dead. Babel says, I'm confident and self-sufficient. I am enough. God on Palm Sunday says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I am not enough. Come and save me, Lord. That's the difference between Babel and Palm Sunday. Oh, that God would save us, each one of us, by by bearing our sins and our iniquities on his Son, Jesus Christ. May each one of us see our need for Christ so that we can cry out with the crowds on Palm Sunday, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We need a king. We need a good king, a saving king, a merciful king. 
Would you abandon your Tower of Babel and go to Christ for salvation? The beautiful picture of this Old Testament passage is it gives way into Abraham, who would be the father of faith, who would, who would through him, come this salvation through Christ into the world. Jesus through Abraham, and the beauty is God came after us. So we are, we are the Babel people who God pursued as we were spread across the world. Let me end with this thought. The Tower of Babel was about a kingdom of man, and for that arrogance and pride, God confused the languages. We heard that. But God had a plan in mind that as the nations spread across the earth and were separated by the human kingdom divides, God had a plan to unite a people under the banner of his kingdom. Okay, so at one point he's breaking us up, but what about a uniting that happens? Babel was a place to dethrone God, but with the coming of Christ, we see the coming of a new kingdom, a heavenly kingdom where God would sit on his throne and his people would follow him and worship him together. It's not bad to have a united humanity if we're doing it with God in mind, with him leading us on. He'll build his kingdom and we will be about that and not about our own human kingdom, starting in our own hearts and also together in the church. Now, the language problem. This is a neat connector. At Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we read this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they had heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Cam <laughs> Pamphylia, I'm getting there, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. Whereas the pride and arrogance and humanism at Babel led to the confusion of languages, with the coming of the kingdom of God and the salvation of Christ, we see at Pentecost a reversal people from different nations hearing the gospel, the truths, and the wonders of God in their own language, a coming back together, a unity of people groups, not to build the tower of man, but to build the kingdom of God. This was a moment where the confusion of Babel was overcome by the Spirit of God, and the sentiment is, these people will come together to serve the Lord that was always meant to be. And indeed, this is what the prophets of the Old Testament spoke of. I just want to read from Zephaniah 3, 9 to 11, in direct contrast to Babel. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted ones and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. Beautiful. This is what God's prophesying to us about. That this would be the day. It's not good that the world wants to gum together in humanity and build a future when they want to do it apart from God. That's going to end badly. God says, I have a plan to bring together a church, to bring together a nation of believers who will be unified in one, as one and will follow me. I end with this, Matthew 23, 12. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Matthew 5, blessed is he who is poor in spirit. In other ones, who realizes their spiritual sin and bankruptcy. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is yours. 
It's yours, dear friends. If we return or if we turn from Babel and our self-pride and our sin and humble ourselves, asking for forgiveness and ask Christ to save us from sin, then we will be servants of a new king, not Nimrod, but a king with a better kingdom, Jesus Christ. So as we enter the Easter season, let's exalt the name of Jesus and humble ourselves before him. With one voice, let's make his name great in the land and not our own name. Let's not be a part of the world's schemes. We have something better, and we have a better king by far. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your... just the way that it comes full circle. The confusion of the languages, the breaking of humanity at Babel because they wanted to go their own way, and then comes full circle to your, your coming and you bringing the nations together under your banner, under your kingdom. We thank you, Lord. I pray that we would help us to be guarded against that same spirit of Babel that's in our world, be guarded against what sounds nice, which is wanting humanity to come together for a better future. That's what we all want, but we want to do it not apart from you, Lord. We pray for our world. We pray for our leaders. We don't want Nimrods as leaders, Lord. We want, we want Jesus as our leader. We want a good king. Who, whose truth dominates where we live and what we do. Help us, Lord, to be used by you as we build the kingdom. Use us, Lord, in order to be salt and light against the silliness of what's being said and the things that are going on. And we thank you, Lord, for coming. We thank you for being our king who has arrived, and we look forward to the day when you will come again as our king. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.